Okay, so we've had lots of laughs already. Thanks to everyone who has come on. Today we're chatting hormones and I found the most interesting people that wants to chat to babybrunch.co.za. So a big warm welcome. If you have just joined us or you have uh, listened to our special broadcasts for the first time, thank you so much for choosing Baby Brunch and uh, our website, of course, babybrunch.co.za. But before we get started and... Uh, Take this very serious topic and unpack it and also have some smiles about it. A big thank you to our support. At Fed Health Medical Aid, nothing's more important than the well-being of your baby and little one. Which is why our FlexiFed 2 and 3 plans enrich your pregnancy and parenting experience with benefits like unlimited GP visits, a doula benefit, a private ward for delivery, trauma treatment in a casualty ward and our free Fed Health baby program. To get more choice, flexibility and control from your growing family's medical aid, call FedHealth today. FedHealth, we let you be you. Now, our first guest for today, Dr. Melinda Vessels. I know her through a friend and a friend and a friend, and I really enjoyed her conversations online. So first of all, Melinda Vessels, bio welcome. It is great to have you. She is a neuropathic endocrinologist. She's based in Nalspreit, and you can find her on Facebook at Altmed Clinic Nalspreit. A warm welcome, Melinda. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for the privilege to be here today. And then Dr. Grant Ferry, who, you know, you never know who you're dealing with until you see their faces online. We researched you extensively <laughs> until we get together today. And I'm like, wait a minute, I know your face. So Grant Ferry is a functional medical professional or practitioner. He has a special interest in hormones. And what makes him really cool is you can check out his website, drgrantferry.co.za, and see all the other things that he does as well. But it's a real privilege to have your time. I know that you're very busy. So welcome, Grant. Anything for anybody who can book four months ahead, really, anytime. <laughs> I want to get started. Melinda, I think I'm going to give this one to you. What are hormones? Give us an idea because the word hormones, it's not exactly like it's the star of the show. When I'm saying I'm hormonal, people don't exactly smile or want to speak to you. So what are hormones? Take us through it. You know, okay. Now, interesting to know is that when patients come to see me, that's exactly what they say. It's either angels or demons. So it's somewhere down the line between the two that we don't always know. But the hormone is actually a chemical messenger that is actually excreted by certain glands that do certain jobs in other organs. For example, it tells us what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. That's basically the easiest way to say it. So, I mean, Grant, you deal with a lot of people. You have the privilege to help a lot of people as, as a functional medical professional. Um, when, when you talk hormones, I mean, do, do you check your hormones in order to have quality of life? Is it something that you do uh, like a checkup? You go and see the dentist or you want to see your gynae? Does, does one check your hormones? I think you check hormones. Hormones are the messengers that are telling the body what to do. They're talking to each other. They're switching things on. They're switching things off. All of your health comes down to the conversation that's happening inside of your body. And the problem is that you don't actually know what the conversation is. You see the outcomes of that conversation, which means you get to sleep and eat and walk and learn and do stuff, but you don't actually know how hard your body's working to do it. And that's kind of where we come into this. We, we recognize that disease is not from, there's not easily judged just by can you do it or not do it, but how hard is your body working? What does it sacrifice to do it? Or what is, uh, which systems are, are, are working with or against each other to actually end up creating the function that we want to see? So it's, a, it's an orchestra. It's a, it's a whole big musical happening in your body. And it's a big, big conversation that medicine has sometimes forgotten uh, needs to be looked at. So absolutely part of a routine investigation, if you see me. Um, exactly what I want to add to that is that, any, that basically every physical and uh, systematic situation in your body is concerning of hormones. So we think of hormones only the sexual part, but there are so many others. Mm -hmm. As you said uh, earlier, perhaps, that there are more than 50 hormones and actually all of them have a certain job to do somewhere. So if I have a patient that has, uh, let's say, um, high migraines or certain situations and I start looking at the hormones first before I start anything else because that's one place in the body where actually we don't really know how it's working in terms of 
a physical thing. You have to relate to symptoms to get the idea of where it's going. And that is something often you missed. So we, yes. we've, we've asked people to submit some questions. So I'm going to get to that in a while. If you've submitted questions on our Facebook page uh, or even in our inboxes, uh, we'll get your questions in a bit. Uh, hormones are not just, Dr. Grant, in, 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 in humans, but it's in food? Um, so you get things that work like hormones, so hormone messengers, and so you get things in milk and in meat, and any, anything that is a protein can essentially send a message so you get things called phytoestrogens or xenoestrogens. So these are things that can have hormone-like effects in our body. And this, we think that's a good example of something that really creates a problem in our modern world is all the estrogen-like hormones that we come into contact with that make both men and women sick. So absolutely, hormones are everywhere because my body's learning and reading from everything that's coming into it and it reacts wrong to many things, especially if my food has been given hormones to increase the, the rate of growth or the taste or whatever it is of that food. So yes, hormones are absolutely weird. And know what's interesting, so is even the, the hormones that get broken down have acti activity as well. So it's the hormones, what they break down into, how they get out of the body. So levels of influence and effect. But so far, hormones, and I mean, I'm sorry to say this because most of you are very passionate about hormones. They just sound like they cause havoc and trouble. <laughs> they don't sound like we need them. Melinda, do, do we get rid of them? Do we even need them? Oh, yes, for sure. You know, um, exactly again, even when you have normal activities every day, we need them every day. For, for me, a simple example like that is, for example, the cortisol hormone. The cortisol hormone is the daily stress hormone. It actually controls a lot of the other hormones. So once our levels are up to a certain stress level and how we do things and meetings and stuff that we do every day, that is where the stress hormone actually comes into power. And once that is a problem or it's overused, it starts hacking on other hormones down the line and we work in a hierarchy to fix that um, specific problem. So we don't start with cortisol only, we end up in a complete different place. Mm -hmm. So yes, we need them every single day because we can't function at all without hormones whatsoever. That is completely true, yes. So I like to use, when a patient comes to me and says, I've got a headache or I've got this or this issue, I always think of how this person will fit into everyday life. And because of that, their hormones or his hormones will function differently than, for example, your and my hormones because we have different priorities and, and uh, the different jobs to do. So, therefore, we always look onto how this person is, who it is, and what job does he does, what kind of stress he has, what beliefs he has. All of those are, in a big sense, also controlled by your hormones. Dr. Grant, I see that you are sitting in your spreekamer. You have got lots of interesting things hanging there. There's a bed. What does a consultation look like? So someone understands that they might have an issue. What, they walk into your practice. What do you ask them? Is it, a, is it quite a lengthy process to establish that you need help? So my consultations are narrative. They are primarily sit down and we talk. We talk for an hour. We talk for two hours. Uh, it's quite an extensive history because... <clears throat> What uh, Melinda also referred to is I'm trying to understand not only which hormones are important in your body, but how they're important specifically in you. So we know different hormones play different roles in different people at different stages of their lives. So by understanding you as an individual and which hormones your body needs uh, is overexpressing or underexpressing, has too much, too little of, is more sensitive to, less sensitive to. So it's a lot of stories and a lot of them involve things you didn't even think had anything to do with hormones, like how you sleep, like your periods, like your PMS, like your moods, like your face, like your weight, like your um, the husband you chose, uh, although that would be weird for me because I didn't ever, <laughs> never chose a husband. Uh, stuff like that. And I totally but agree long with conversation. that. Yeah, because you also know, I think uh, uh, Dr. Grant and my practice are, are almost the same type of situation where we take yeah. our time with our patients. So it's not the 15 minutes thing, it's an hour, hour and a half, two hours. And what I also like to um, say is that uh, people will understand then when they got out there, it's a personalized thing. It's not a uh, one size fits all. So everything that you say, is taking into consideration the long term of how the outcome will be of your certain problem. 
do you do you speak to your gynae first before you consult with someone like like you two a, a, a functional medicine practitioner that that understands hormones and have, that have helped many people we read your reviews online dr free so so i mean people people really find um find help because it's a serious issue and, and the same with you melinda it's wonderful to see that you help so many people. Do you do you start at your gynae or do you start at someone like like you, an endocrinologist, or uh, where where do you even start? Well, to be honest with me, it works like that. That I'm almost all the time the last resort. They have been to many doctors and many specialists, mm-hmm. and they um, sometimes not get to solve the issue. And I think the, uh, the most problematic situation here is because of time. And I think Dr. Grant will agree with me that the more time you spend with your patient, the easier you understand where the problem is coming from. I mean, we've been taught that if you listen long enough to your patient, you will hear the question and the answer. You have to just focus on what they say and kind of get the whole situation in a big, huge puzzle. That's what I always tell patients. Mm. I'm either a project manager or a... Um, I build puzzles and you are the puzzle that I have to build and every puzzle is different. So I think they are frustrated by the time they came here. So most of the time they start off not with us, they end with us. So then all the other possibilities are already being sorted and tried out and they didn't work or maybe they're halfway or not, but they're desperate people. And I think Dr. Grant will agree with me that we don't sit with the normal problems. We sit with the utmost weirdest, funniest, complicated stuff over the world and that's why it takes so long sometimes to just solve the smallest issue would be a problem. Yeah, I'll agree. Uh, possibly over time, as I've developed a bit more of a reputation, probably do see people sooner than I used to. Um, but what we find with specialists is that specialists are trained, they're highly qualified in smaller areas of the body. So yeah. gynees tend to deal with female hormones uh, endocrinologists deal with thyroid and maybe diabetes. Um, so each one, physicians might have a bit of overlap there, mm-hmm. but there are very few people that will see all of them together. So we kind of have that thing of the, in the orchestra example is the cello goes to the cello doctor and the piano goes to the piano doctor. And there's too few people who look at the whole orchestra. And uh, I like to be the conductor in, in my story, so the puzzle. But I want to know that we're all playing with the same sheet of music. I want to know that we're all playing the same volume. I want to know that we actually uh, can make it work together. And there's very few people that actually are yeah. privileged, fortunate enough to have it all put together for them in a one big package where we start to set. So I kind of feel like I fall into a gap between the generalist and the specialist. I don't compete with either. And I, I like to think that functional medicine becomes the, the bridge between these two. So specialists stay in their special niches, generalists stay in their general niches, right. and we become the guys to go, but this seems to be a disconnection of, of things that are, are intricate and complex. And we do have the thing of doctors tend to use the tools that are most available to them. And so a gynae is going to find a gynae problem and an orthopedic surgeon is wow. going to find an orthopedic, orthopedic problem. problem. And that's, that's really a problem, uh, which why we think, and I don't even criticize the, my colleagues for that anymore. It's harder and harder if you only do one thing to, to know less and less about everything else. So, so Melinda's right. We, we do seem to find people that have been to 10 different doctors, but nobody's ever pulled it all together. I'm going to give each of you a task to unpack shortly. Okay. So um, Dr. Grant, I'm giving you menopause. What happens to our hormones and what role does it play in menopause? So the most common hormones that we see in menopause are the ones that the ovaries are responsible for making, and that relates to a monthly cycle, which means that in a cycle, you're supposed to have three phases. You're supposed to have a phase where you have a period. You're supposed to have a phase where your body prepares an egg. Then you have a phase where your body waits to see if there's going to be a pregnancy. And at the end of that, if there's no pregnancy, the cycle begins again. So that very, 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 very important cycle that that knits into every other part of how that woman's body works stops. So she kind of runs out of eggs. It seems to be the thing for whatever reason. It's not always as simple as that. But it also can be that the brain stops telling the ovary to prepare these eggs. So for some other reason, her body stops the cycles. And invariably, all the hormones don't stop happening at the same time. So for the beginning, the ovary doesn't always necessarily get that message. 
And so one of the hormones just carries on being made and it's not balanced with the others. So because the cycles aren't there anymore, so you get uh, some hormones that dominate, others that go missing. Then doctors try to intervene with contraceptives and hormone things and intrauterine things. And uh, so we try to balance them and fix them and then we break them as well. And they end up at uh, psychiatrists with depression and at uh, places to help them lose weight. And they see all sorts of people to try and help them. But actually, the, I tell people, the lucky women get hot flushes. And why I say they're lucky is because that kind of most people get that when you get hot flushes, that, that means you're going to menopause. But a lot of women just become a little bit foggy in, in, in their thinking, mm. or they start to be put on weight, or they start to become depressed or sad, or they lose their spark, or they, um, they start to become depressed, we talked about, or they look or they tire, tiredness becomes a real thing, or they struggle to sleep, or they start to become disconnected for their family members. So those people don't recognize that this is just something happening in their body that's just not controlling their normal uh, body's ability to manage itself. So they get blood pressure rises, they get cholesterol rises. And I'll tell you, so by the time I see you, the women are on a cholesterol pill, a thyroid pill, a blood pressure pill. Melinda knows this. Uh, an yes. antidepressant, a sleeping tablet, an anxiety tablet. So for something that's as normal as waking up in the, norm, in the morning, menopause, you get five different medicines. And there's nothing actually even wrong with you because you're not sick. You're going through a phase. But it's not a pleasant phase, mm. but it's different for every woman. But this is where the education component comes into, which is why I'm very happy to do shows like this, is that we have to, if the woman knows, wait, there's nothing wrong with me. Maybe I'm at that place where I'm going through this phase. Then she'll ask the right question from the right person instead of just thinking that it's stress or tiredness or laziness or bad eating. It's like, no, your body's changing. And you, you, you can't fight that with food. You can't fight it with exercise. And, and you'll note that you remember that thing, you don't feel like doing anything. So yes, maybe you want to exercise, but you don't feel like it. You're sore or you're heavy or you're tired or you exercise and you just want to sleep afterwards. So it's kind of recognizing that you're not broken. You're going through a phase. Your body has to go through. It has to change. And we can help it enormously. Uh, so you can test the hormones, which we chatted about earlier. You can, we can know at every step of the journey, well, what are the changes? Which of the hormones is dominating? Which of them is missing? And we can put just that one in just for a little while. I'll tell you what another big one is. Free, I hope it's, uh, is, are the babies in bed? Libido, <laughs> let's use the big drive. Sex drive. Yeah. The, you know the girls, when it's like, God, if he does it, if he, he looks at me, I just want to throw things. And it's like, you know, that's partly because he, yeah, because he <laughs> drives you crazy. It's not all hormones. Right. But, but when your body switches off, it suddenly doesn't want the things that it used to want. It doesn't feel attractive. It doesn't feel sexy. It doesn't want to be touched or looked at. It's, it, it, it's a hormone thing as well. It's not always a relationship thing, but then it becomes a relationship thing. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how, how often we would be able to save people's marriages. Uh, just by fixing their hormones. Okay. Why does early menopause happen? Why does the body say it's time to go into it early? So, so, so you get a thing, it's called secondary amenorrhea or secondary menopause. Uh, prior, uh, you get real menopause, this is when I've run out of eggs, but you get a thing where the body goes into a fatigue or a stress state. Uh, and like any creature in the world, when it goes into a chronic stress or fatigue state, the body no longer deems it viable or fit or healthy to reproduce so the body can actively shut down reproduction it can stop it because it's not good for you or for the baby that you want to carry mm -hmm. so so premature menopause you've got to be very careful so if i see you and you went to menopause under the age of 48 i don't accept it until i've proven it and i, and I do a lot of work to make sure this really is menopause mm -hmm. uh, and what are you must be 23 or 4 already so that's highly unlikely that you're in real menopause and then also if a woman's not gone into menopause and she's more than 53, 54, that's also getting a little bit late. So, so we want to check both of these women. But no, premature menopause is a different condition. It's a sickness, a pathology, until proven otherwise. And I feel like as soon as the doctor says, oh, don't worry, you just run out of eggs. It's menopause. Here's a hormone for you. Wrong. I totally agree with you. I just quickly want to add something to that, um, Dr. Grant. I think you might agree with that. Is that in my studies, we had um, found 
that there are actually more than one type of menopause anyway. So it depends on the ratios of what organs are the most dominant at that stage will determine your symptoms. For example, if you're yeah, estrogen right. dominant, then obviously then would be some completely different than you have high testosterone left and all the other hormones are just going down the drain to completely different symptoms. And that is also why I agree with you that when patients come to us, then that's exactly what happened. We try to figure out which type you are, and because of that, you get actually individual treatment. So therefore, you're going to be treated as your next door neighbor or your niece or your best friend. They all be completely different. Okay, so let's talk endometriosis. Dr. Melinda, what happens and what roles do the hormones play? I mean, how do you even know that this is happening to your body? Endometriosis. Okay. First of all, let me quickly explain in kind of easier terms of what endometriosis are. And I'm going to take it in the concept of a baby eating her first porridge with a teaspoon. And you know that half of the teaspoon porridge doesn't enter your mouth. It ends all over the kitchen. Mm. So that is actually what happens is that when you have endometrial tissue, now that is the inner lining of your uterus, and it grows outside of the uterus. That means not in the uterus where it should be. It grows in your intestine, on your ovaries, everywhere else. But remember, because it's like a porridge, it sticks to that situation, it sticks to that organ. So start growing in the same way, uh, harmonically, in terms of your phases that Dr. Grant had so nicely explained, that it grows and goes down together with all the other situations inside your uterus. So now you get a young woman that has extreme pain, funny periods, all angry and achy and huge amount of menstruation, blood, So they are sore and they're irritated. And when it comes to infertility, it's a big, big deal. So that is when you start looking for endometriosis is when there are, first of all, extreme pain and extremely uncomfortable and bleeding a lot. And it's all over the place, all over the place. And you've got lots of other nasty symptoms like fatigue, headaches. But most of the time, there's hectic, hectic um, cycles that they just can't control. And they're very tired and irritated by the end. And normally when they do that then, that is when they get to a gynae and they normally put them on a contraceptive to control this type of situation. So that's that's normally for the Because it's people. one of the things we discussed. We talked about contraceptives in a previous conversation. Um, I'm quite interested in that. So uh, I know we're still with endometriosis, but if I take the pill, is that a hormone that I'm putting into my body? Is it bad or good? It is... Um, a difficult question to answer because of the fact that why you need this contraceptive. If you want it before because of you don't want any babies right now, that's a good thing. But we must remember that lots of these hormones are synthesized. So it's not completely like your own. So they will act dominantly on your own ovary. So they will kind of do a takeover thing. And in the long run, you don't have any of your own female hormones or even your male hormone that are exactly working as it should. This one takes it over. So it's a bad thing if you do it for your skin. I mean, young teenager, uh, teenagers that got acne or bad skin issues go to a doctor and they put them immediately on a hormone tablet without checking a bit further. So that already is a big sign for me to calm down on contraceptives because long run, you can do sometimes more damage than good because of that. Because we will sit, might end up, but the longer you are on a contraceptive, you end up being having difficulty to fall pregnant after you've come off that contraceptive. So you get people that have been uh, 16 or 15 years and then they want to fall pregnant and then it's a big deal. It feels like hormones are responsible for a lot of good, but also for a lot of bad. And I mean, psychosis, we've done a podcast on, on psychosis before. Uh, if you want to check that out, go to babybrunch.co.za. It's, it's among one of the topics that we've spoken about before. But I look at, I mean, Dr. Grant, maybe you can help me with this one. What if you've had a, a miscarriage? or a stillborn and you were pregnant, but you don't have the baby. It feels like hormones are even responsible for those feelings that happens after the baby, but also depression. It, it, it's a bit of an oversimplification to just blame hormones. So we don't actually, if you know the reason for the miscarriage, that can contribute. So your thyroid can be part of that. Uh, your immune system can be part of that. Your uh, adrenal system can be part of that. Your hormones... They really aren't. I think, you know, hormones are, you, you obviously, look, you can't live without them. They have work that they have to do. Um, the, the critical thing is they must work together. 
and you can spend your entire life getting those things to, to work together. And everything we do uh, imbalances them. So if I exercise this morning, I create an imbalance. My body then has to spend time to rebalance them. If I get pregnant, I create an imbalance. My body then has to spend time during a pregnancy balancing my hormones. After the pregnancy, rebalancing those hormones while I'm breastfeeding, which means a new hormone in the system that my body's not used to, mm. while it's trying to decide if it must start having babies again, so it must decide must I have new cycles while I'm breastfeeding after just having a baby, based on the stress levels, because you can uh, relate to the little bit of tiredness that you feel as a new mommy, it's like, are you joking? Imagine it's like one of your worst thoughts possible is falling pregnant after just having had a baby. And yet we see it all the time because the ladies don't know. Some are lucky not to have periods after they give birth, but some can fall pregnant a month later. Mm. So there's just no telling. And everybody's so different. And there's just so many factors. The food you eat plays a role. Um, the air you breathe. So I work a lot with environmental toxins and, and um, these play a role in your system health, your immune health. So it's really, you can't just blame everything on the hormones, but what you can say is the hormones are trying to fix it. So functional medicine is also trying to ask this question. What is your body trying to do to help you? You might not like how it feels, but it's always trying to correct and heal and help and get you balanced so that you can carry on doing what you do. And, and, and to be fair, most of us have imbalanced hormones most of the time and don't even know it. So our bodies are incredible. And that's all I'm trying to do is first respect the work that our bodies do to keep that balance. And then my job as a doctor is not to take over that role, uh, but to find a way to assist your body with the function and the process that it's trying to achieve. So postpartum depressions definitely relates to hormones. Uh, amongst other things, but it can be mineral deficiency. You can have a magnesium deficiency and get postpartum depression. Thyroid, thyroid is a common, coming back to your question about uh, premature menopause. Thyroid, postpartum depressions, fatigue, weight, um, uh, and, and premature menopause is, for me, it's a thyroid problem until proven otherwise. Melinda, we have now touched on uh, cause, what it could be, you know? Uh, Dr. Grant has also unpacked lightly about the different things, whether it is um, de a depression, fatigue, being overweight, the food we eat. I mean, Baby Branch is just a platform where we start a conversation and then we need to go and see our healthcare pr pr practitioners because we, we need help. And so when it comes to the treatment, I want to quickly know it. When people come to your consultation room, um, how do they fix it? Like, do you draw blood? Do you have to have a, do a colposcopy? How, how do you actually find out how to start treatment on us? Okay, first of all, I think Dr. Grant had actually said in the beginning that our consultation is quite long. So that helps a lot because, as again, the medical history, definitely. And then we do, for me, I do blood tests, but I also compare it with urology that maybe might not be a complete in, um, new thing for most people where we look into the eyes and we see different clues and I just must emphasize it's not a diagnostic tool like a lot of doctors believe in, but we get clues from the body and therefore we take it from there and then, the, and then the pains, you know, start with the easier stuff first. How's your lifestyle? How's your diet? How's your exercise pattern? How is your stress levels? How's your sleeping pattern? Any pains and aches? And from then we take it to the next levels. Like for example, do we have to start with a new diet? Do we have to watch over the way how you exercise? Then we do, for me, because I'm a naturopath, I go the natural way. So I would choose something that can help. For example, if it was a, a hormonal problem, I will look into bioidentical hormone therapy. It is completely different and a topic, again, for a complete other day, because there's a huge difference, again, between what doctors gave and what we do. Uh, and then again, after that, we come back, we reassess, and we see how we have do baby steps. I like to do the baby step thing, so I don't give too much at the same time. We do it little by little. And then from there on, we see how the body helps himself, exactly like Dr. Grant said. We are, just we are just facilitators. We are not really going to interfere with the body. We help as far as we can for the body to help himself. 
I like how you've changed my per- per- perception about um, about hormones that they're there to help, you know, that they're there to fix, and and I enjoy that it because is. yeah, it, it gives reassurance, you know, that there's not these fighters in our body, but they're actually there to build and to and to fix and to help. Doctor Grant is nodding his head. Thank goodness. Okay, so <laughs> Doctor, what is <laughs> what does treatment look like in your case? Do you also mm-hmm. shine a light in our eyes and draw blood? If I look too deep into your eyes, my wife has a problem with it. So I <laughs> use more. Um, I do blood tests. I do saliva tests. I do urine tests. I use uh, some fancy urine tests that we send overseas, even that looks at all the hormones that your body's making and excreting. And that helps me to see what your body can make and what it's using. And all those things I said, the hormones break into s- sort of smaller particles. I can tell all of those things from urine tests. I do things called organic acid testing and I do things called genetic testing. So the genetic testing also helps me to see which uh, sort of pathways in your liver your body tends to prefer and that helps me to direct the treatments along specific. It just it just helps me skip over um, some trickier things to know. Like this, We can see from your DNA, your genetics, that your body prefers to treat a thing this way or that way or it's unable to do a thing this way or that way. Um, so we, we have many, many tools available that conventional doctors don't always know a lot about. It's things I had to go and learn oh, about. Yes, if they know about it, yeah. and, and I'm sure Melinda knows about these things too. So we do overlap a lot in what we do. Um, the blood test, I, yeah. Um, so I don't... Uh, I, physical exam sometimes just make sure that you're going to live long enough to get my treatment. So I will check you, make sure your heart's beating and your lungs are filling and I'll, I'll touch you and feel you. And, um, but not much more than most doctors. And because I'm actually seeing you often as the third, fourth, fifth or sixth doctor, a lot of that stuff's been done already. Mm. And so I'm kind of getting down those really technical biochemical level you know so I'm, I'm i'm lucky enough to have a lot of the work done for me uh in that sense and then we just kind of pull it all together and add those finishing touches and and, and fine tune it so uh but i don't do this for everybody so i also start simply and um sort of do the tests as i feel like they're necessary most people can be treated very simply um in, in fact if it wasn't for sort of medical and professional sort of legal issues i think i could treat most patients i see without any tests at all the problem is that when something goes wrong you need to have information uh, and evidence to fall back on to justify the decision that you made so that's an unfortunate thing about modern medicine is that i i just need to show proof of why i decided to go that route right but you can hear like this is after an hour or two with the patient i i know 80% of the time, what's wrong, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to fix it. I totally and agree. The blood tests are normally there to confirm my diagnosis and very seldom to make my diagnosis. Dr. Melinda, there's, there's help for us. There's, there's help for us. Yeah. There is unbelievably a lot of help. You know, I think that we don't want to look at our patients and hear what they say. That's what is the most Baie keer kom ek die gevoel kry, as die patiënte by alkom, hulle is nie gehoor nie, hulle is gefrustreerd, hulle wil raar gehoor, en hulle is desperaat vir hulle. En die kleinste dingetje wat jy recht doen, en wat jylle meer vrou om jou te help, want dit word een spanpoging, dit is nie, soos wat Dr. Grant gesê, dit is ek is die dokter en jy is die patiënt nie. Dit word een spanpoging, en jy luister wat hulle sê, en elke klein dingetje wat jy help, van die emoties, van hartseer dag na jou babiekie verloor het, tot die volgende babiekie wat gegore word, dit is alles die emoties wat jylle vrou hard wil. En um, ek dink, dit is van die belangse ding om te besef, jy kan al die goed help door die lichaam self aan die gang te kry en self te laat, doet al laat om om jou te help. Dan heb jy nie daar echt te interfeer nie. Dit is ook met makkelijk as nie jy kan en soms moeilik, want betekie moet jy patiënt bieke ontrafel voor jy kan achterkom precies wat gaan in sy lichaam aan. So it's always good to know there's always help and there's lots of help that just get to the right people and make them listen to you. If not, you walk out the door. If they don't listen to you, you don't go to them again. Wow. Dr. Grant, wow. Yep. there's help for us. You can just translate what she said, because <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Well, I would like to do mine in, in Greek, please. No, please don't. So, uh, there's help for uh, us. 
hormones is so not there. there is so much of help there is so much of help so a if you don't feel good you're not allowed to stop looking there's somebody out there that has the answer for your problem right. and uh, you the more integrative kind of got a bad name because people thought it was quacky holistic or alternative but integrative means everything and when i tell people i'm holistic i say it doesn't mean we're going to pray a, a weird prayer over you it's my whole as in complete and as an extensive and as in the full picture so the broader the person thinks even if it's just to get ideas then you can go back to your other doctor and say what do you think of this because sometimes doctors we got a lot to think about sometimes it actually helps when the patient puts the thought in your head and goes do this other person said this could be the thing and i don't think that's a bad thing if your doctor is offended by google then i would even suggest that's a reason to change doctors because yes. doctors who are offended or scared of mm -hmm. learning something from their patients um i feel like need to ask questions uh, of their own arrogance so uh, i like in fact i tell my patients what do you mean you didn't google it show some interest go home google your problem and come back when you think you know what's going on you can find the amazing dr melinda vessels she is a naturopathic endocrinologist on facebook she is at alt med clinic nelspruit ons kan nie wag om jou te kom sien nie ons moet gaan koffie drink ek en jy and then dr and then Dr. Grant Free, uh, he's a functional medical pr practitioner with a special interest in hormones and actually a whole host of things. But I want you to go and check out his website. So it's drgrantfree.co.za.